two weeks ago, I was at the celebration, the 50th anniversary celebration of a school building that had been built 50 years ago in the county town of Newbury, one of my past parishes. And it was great at that event to reflect on 50 years of teaching, 50 years of teaching knowledge, teaching skill, teaching faith. And then two days ago, I was at the retirement of a primary head teacher who had been head teacher for 16 years. And she was a head who inspired people. She inspired the staff, she inspired the children, she inspired the families, and she inspired them at all different levels, but especially at the level of faith, and how central faith was to her and to them, the importance of faith to her and to them, and the essential nature of faith to her and to them. Teaching the faith is important, and that's why all of us are gathered here today. But more important than knowledge is being a disciple of the Lord. And remember what we just heard in that gospel. A disciple should grow to be like the teacher. About four weeks ago, in one of the churches that I celebrate Mass in, there were a, a couple who were a stranger. And after Mass, I asked them what they were doing in Southampton. And they said they were going on a cruise, a cruise up the fjords, up Norway and the fjords. Then I asked them where they came from, and they told me where they came from, and I said, oh, the bishop, your bishop, is a great friend of mine. I said, we go on holiday together. He was my first parish priest when I was first ordained a priest and the the lady the wife said well 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 that explains it all she said because she said as mass went on the way you celebrated mass your mannerisms what you said how you said it I said to my husband during a period of silence, this man is like our bishop. He's got the characteristics and the phrases and the way of preaching just like our bishop. And I said, well, that's probably because I worked with him for seven years. And when you work with someone whom you respect and who you are learning from, then you pick up the mannerisms, the way of talking, the way of responding to people. And that is what we are invited to do with the person of Christ. We are called to pick up the mannerisms of Christ, to develop the way of Jesus, and to reflect Jesus through what we say, what we do, and certainly by who we are. In that first reading that we read, which I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, the prophet Isaiah comes into the awesome presence of God in the temple. And as he comes into the awesome presence of God, he hears the seraph singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy. 
And that experience of the awesomeness of God, that experience that Isaiah has in that temple that day, makes him become aware of his wretched state. Makes him become aware of his sense of being lost, not too sure where he is going. And it makes him very aware of his uncleanliness. Through that awareness of God's majesty and power, Isaiah becomes aware of his lowliness and weakness. And therefore, he is enabled immediately to respond to God's call. Here I am. Send me. And it's that experience of the presence of the awesome God, when we really experience that, we become aware of who we actually are. But in our weakness, we're able to respond. Here I am. Send me. It's no accident. Well, I don't think it's an accident anyway. It's no accident that the church sings the song of the seraphs at Mass. So as we prepare to come into the awesome presence of Christ in the Eucharist, we proclaim the holiness of God. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth. And as we're drawn deeper into the holiness of God in our Eucharist, as we're drawn in to the Eucharistic Christ, we acknowledge our loneliness. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. And in that very act, we are made worthy. In that very act of recognizing in the Eucharist the presence of God, in recognizing in the Eucharist the cosmic Christ that we are being drawn into. Because remember, whenever we celebrate Eucharist, we're not just following the Jesus of Nazareth. In the Eucharist, we're being drawn into the cosmic Christ, the universal King, the King of creation, our King and Master. We're being drawn into his life. As we attempt to draw him into ours, actually, he draws us right in to his life. And in that act, we are made worthy of Christ. In that act, we are made worthy of Christ's closeness. In that act, we are made worthy to be in the presence of God. And so our worthiness, the worthiness that all of us have as human beings, as children of God, as brothers and sisters of Christ, that worthiness is not of our making. That worthiness is of the making of God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We become holy not by what we do, not by what we say, not by wh who we are, we become holy because God is holy and we're being drawn into that holiness in our Eucharistic celebration. That holiness that you and I are drawn into, that holiness is developed, deepened, strengthened by our prayers. Prayer is so essential. But it's also developed and deepened and strengthened by our devotions and especially our celebration of the sacraments and the Eucharist. But all of this is not an added extra, but an essential element. Holiness is only developed, deepened, strengthened if we walk daily with Christ. We can't just latch him on at the beginning of the week 
or at the end of the week, we have to daily walk with Christ in our lives. I find it fascinating. In St. John's Gospel, the beginning of St. John's Gospel, some of the disciples followed Jesus. And what I find fascinating is the beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't tell us what to do. He doesn't teach us. He doesn't tell us what is right and wrong. The beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus' first words are a question. And the question to the disciples following him is, what do you want? Master, they say, where do you live? Come and see, he says. And they spend the rest of the day with Jesus. And the rest of the day in John's Gospel is not simply until dusk. I'm sure that's what they did on that first day. But the rest of the day with Jesus really means they spent the rest of their lives with him. Remember, the disciples were friends of Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They listened to Jesus. They watched Jesus. They probably played with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They breathed the same air as Jesus. They prayed with Jesus. They were scolded by Jesus. They were told off by Jesus. They were rebuked by Jesus. In other words, their lives, in a sense, was Jesus' life. Jesus' life was their life. And I suppose to take it even deeper, in a sense, their hearts began to beat with the rhythm of Christ's heart. And Christ's heart began to beat with the rhythm of their hearts. They began to see with Jesus' eyes and minds and heart. And he was seeing with their eyes and minds and hearts. I'm sure you're familiar with the logo for the Year of Mercy. You may have it as a, as a prayer card. You may have it in your churches. And some people don't like the three eyes. If you look at Jesus carrying us, Good Shepherd, or the Good Samaritan, carrying the other person, there are just the three eyes. One eye is Jesus, one eye is us, and the other eye is shared. It's nothing mystical, but it's the artist saying, Jesus sees out of our eyes, and we are called to see out of Jesus' eyes. Jesus' heart beats with our heart. We are invited to allow, allow our hearts to beat with Jesus' heart. And for us to call ourselves Christian, to call ourselves Catholics, to call ourselves followers of Jesus, disciples of Christ or children of God, we need to really allow Christ's beating heart to share with our beating heart. We need to get into synchronization, as it were, or into rhythm with the beating heart of Jesus. And just as Christ is transparent to us, remember, Jesus stripped himself in our presence, stripped himself physically, but more importantly, he stripped himself emotionally and spiritually. And just as he became transparent to us, so we must become transparent to him. Transparent to him in so many ways. Because a disciple, as we heard in the gospel, should grow to be like the teacher, the slave like the master. We should see Jesus because Jesus sees us 
and we should let Jesus see us as we are. There's a question, isn't there? And I suppose the question is, how do we let Jesus see us as we are? How do we allow our hearts to beat with the beat of Christ's heart? There are many ways, I imagine, but I want to talk just about three ways in particular. The first is prayer. Prayer. We must be people of genuine prayer. We must in our prayer let God see me as I am. Not as I would like to be, but as I am. That is where my prayer needs to be. Not just words, not just formula, but real dialogue with the risen Lord. Real dialogue in his presence. Now sometimes we need to give up the books that we hold on to too firmly because sometimes they become a barrier between me and the Lord and I hide myself behind them. We all know Saint Bernadette and her, the apparitions of our Blessed Lady to Bernadette in Lourdes. And remember in one of those apparitions, when people said to Bernadette, what did she say? What did the lady say? Because they were interested in what the lady said. In one of those visions, Bernadette said, she looked at me and I looked at her. She looked at me and I looked at her. And that's important in our prayer. That our prayer is about letting God look at us. And certainly us looking at God. Like two lovers. Two lovers who don't need words. Two lovers who don't need formula. Two lovers who don't need books. Sometimes we do. But very often we don't. When we fall in love. Just to gaze upon the person we love and let them gaze upon us, warts and all, is all we need. So we need to develop that prayer relationship with God through the person of Jesus. We also need to develop walking with Jesus on a daily basis by our actions and our attitudes. We must judge all our attitudes and our actions by one criteria alone. Is that action a loving action? Is it a response in love? Are my thoughts, my words, my deeds that we ask forgiveness for at the beginning of Mass are my thoughts, words and deeds rooted in love out of love given in love am I a true neighbour tomorrow's gospel the good Samaritan why did Jesus have to explain that to good people? He had to explain that to good people because all of us tend to have a narrow understanding of who my neighbour is. I judge myself on is my response out of love and because of love. Am I compassionate, merciful, forgiving, and in this year of mercy, that is something we really need to get to grips with. Because the God that we glorify, the God that we praise, the God of Jesus Christ that we are being drawn into every moment and every day, is a God of unconditional compassion, unconditional mercy, unconditional forgiveness, because it is unconditional love. 
We can't be like that. But that is where we should aspire to be. To be the visible face of the invisible Father that the prayer of mercy talks about. And then the third thing would be our religious devotions, and especially the Mass and the sacraments. We always need to ask ourselves, are our devotions, and especially the sacraments, are they genuine acts of worship or just play acting? Are they about my relationship with God through Christ? Or am I more concerned about the superficial aspects of my worship and my devotions? If I only do nine Hail Marys, have I failed? If I only do eight Hail Marys, have I failed? It's not the what we do, it's the why we do it. And even in the Old Testament, and Jesus himself, are so critical of empty worship, external actions, empty actions that cover up who we actually are. Our worship must come from being people of integrity. And in our worship, in our devotions, we need to open ourselves up and again let God see us as we are. If we don't let God see us as we are, we cannot in our Eucharist be drawn into the cosmic Christ. If we don't let God see us as we are, we cannot in the sacrament of reconciliation actually benefit from the great forgiveness that God gives us. Our actions, in a sense, speak louder than words. And they should convey to me and to others the reality of my relationship with God, the reality of my relationship with Christ, the reality of my relationship with one another, the body of Christ. So our concern mustn't be just on the window dressing, but on what the window dressing points to. And it points to my relationship with God, to your relationship with God, to our relationship with God. In all these ways, prayer, our living action, our worship and devotion, we develop a personal and profound relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's that relationship that is the key to my life, the key to my faith, the key to my eternity. It's the key to our lives, the key to our faith, the key to our eternity. And only then, only then, can you, I, us, become, as we pray in that year of mercy prayer, the visible face of the invisible Father. And if we become that visible face of the invisible Father, not only will we find ourselves continually changing day by day and week by week as we go down the road towards holiness with God, but more importantly, we will affect the world that we inhabit and enable that world to experience God in their midst because we have the courage to allow God to see us as we are. Have that courage in our prayer, in our worship, in our day-to-day -day life, and we will beat with the heart of Christ. And in the beating with the heart of Christ, let the world see not me, but Christ. Not me, but the visible face of the invisible Father, and by so doing, be drawn into God's life.